All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Hilt Spring Quarterly Meeting. Uh, we are very excited that you're here. Uh, a few different things just for housekeeping. If you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself into the group chat, that would be appreciated. Go ahead and say your name, your organization, and your role. In addition, if you wanna hover over your three ellipses in your picture box, you can go ahead and rename yourself. If you look in my example, I do have my name, organization, and my pronouns. It's just to ensure that as we're referring to everyone that we are using correct pronouns. Um, if you can go ahead and just do that now, we will get started. And we are gonna get started with a welcome, uh, but afterwards, just like I said, to go over a few ellipses, uh, you have your video feed here, uh, go ahead and use that freely. Um, in addition to the chat box, say hello. Uh, go ahead and mute yourself when you are not speaking. And then, um, like I said, use the chat box freely. And we do like to uh, keep messages in there because we do keep copy of that and, and keep that for our files. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. To start, we're going to go ahead and hear from one of our captains, Yoli Grandjean. Yoli? Thanks, James. And good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. I am Yoli Grandjean. I'm a health captain and I'm clinical education program manager at Neighbor Care Health. And it's my pleasure to welcome you and just say thank you so much for the time that you're investing in this work, which feels more important now than ever. Maybe seems silly to say that, but um, we are really needing to take advantage of these networking opportunities to focus on how to develop our workforce. I was just in a meeting this morning where we were talking about staffing and what a challenge it has been. And what I always walk away from with these HILP meetings is that we are better together in terms of collaborating and looking at solutions and figuring out how to address these problems as a system. Um, I think the next slide touches on how we're hoping to do that today. So James, if you wanna move us forward. Um, we would like to use this time as that forum to collaborate, to network, to figure out how we can work together. And we'll also hear about what we've been doing, some of the great work that's happened with HILT. And what I'm really excited about today is this best practice sharing. So hearing from each other about what's working well, what we can learn from each other, and what we can all carry forward. So thanks again for being here. Thank you, Yoli. Um, that's great. And then we're just going to touch briefly about the Hilt Spring Projects. Uh, you know, Hilt has been busy this entire time, uh, not only the entire year, but especially in the spring. We've had a lot of great events that have occurred. And just to kind of give a brief update, you know, we did have a, the Sound Careers in Healthcare Week. We had that the last week in April. So thank you to everyone uh, that participated and especially you know, Shauna and Denise, uh, y'all were a great support during that week as well. They were part of that leadership committee and were there at many meetings uh, throughout the week. <laughs> and even uh, we have meetings coming up as well, uh, just to kind of reconcile some of that data. But it was a fantastic week and it was a free week long event for, uh, you know, focused on students that were age 16 to 24 that are interested in healthcare. Um, and I must report that students are still excited to be in healthcare. Um, even through the pandemic, even things that we're thinking about, or at least some of my biases that I might think about for young individuals, we still have a strong interest for people who want to help and lean into the work. So thank you for all your help with that. Uh, that event was focused for BIPOC and all students interested in healthcare, especially first generation and low income. In addition, we also had uh, the Teaching Cultural Humility Workshop that just occurred last week. A great, great session. Thank you for all of everyone who attended. Uh, we got some hands up from DJ3, I would, I would concur. Um, fantastic discussion. I wanna say it was one of our meetings where we had a lot of different voices that were heard, and even especially from ones that we've not heard uh, sometimes in, in every meeting. So please bring that forward. Let's keep that energy going. Your perspective and your voice is incredibly wanted and needed, and we definitely appreciate that. So feel free to chime in. But from that Teaching Culture Humility Workshop, uh, we got great discussion as well, and we went through a few scenarios, and we've got a little bit more updates on that later on in this meeting. 
In addition, you know, the next generation sector partnership, that is where this HILT forum kind of comes from. And Lindsay and her constituents have been very busy. In fact, last week, uh, Ryan and I and Wendy and a few others, we were able to join one of her national meetings online and really talk about the HILT network here in, here in the Puget Sound area and talk about all the great work that we're doing. Um, as you know, we're, we're coming around four years now and so through those developments, we've got a lot of great gains and sharing that with the national constituents and people interested in creating their own ILT, it's really fantastic for them to hear some of the work that we've done and all the advances that we have. So lots of fantastic, great updates that we have going on. So thank you. Today, we do have committee workshop updates. Thank you, everybody. Oh, sorry, James, thought I was on for this. No you worries. Are. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, everyone, I'm Shalann Aldridge, and I'm one of the co-conveners here at the Hilt. And so, we have had a lot of really great work going on within our committees. And um, I'm going to turn it over to some of our awesome uh, chairs of these committees and co-chairs to talk a little bit more about the work that's going on. Again, it's a great way to get plugged into. Um, some of the specific detailed work and to really get your uh, hands dirty or get involved in that. So uh, Susie, why don't you kick us off and talk to us about the Behavioral Health Committee and how that's recently uh, reconvened and is starting to get some legs again. Yeah, we're going to start diving in deep. So I'm Susie Winston and I'm a longtime behavioral health provider here in King County. Uh, I started working at Sound in 1986 as a child and family therapist, and I'm still plugging along and, and still enthusiastic about it. So um, I have the honor of sharing the Behavioral Health Committee. It had been Charlotte Jones, but she's really just too busy. And together we decided somebody that was a provider might actually lend some uh, information to the to the. Uh, to the committee. So I want to quickly, if I can, share, can't, oh, I can't share my screen. Okay, I thought I could. Um, well, we're going to have our next meeting will be on Wednesday, the 22nd of May, and an invite just went out. If you didn't get it and you're interested in attending, please shoot me an email and let me know. But we're going to uh, dive into outlining our scope and our purpose. We're going to identify an ongoing meeting time and, and rhythm or cadence to that, how frequently we're going to meet. We're going to really dive into discussing how to engage with students and how to promote pathways and attract talent. The other thing we're going to be working on is how to do some mentorship and uh, engage the new grads um, into uh, supporting ongoing learning. So um, it should be a pretty good meeting and it's the beginning of us getting going on this again. So please feel free to join me if you're interested. So Suti, you can share your screen now if you'd like. Oh, well, I just I don't know that it's gonna be useful at this point, but we'll see. Okay. I'll at least give them a peek, right? Yep. There you go. So outline the scope, identify a cadence, discuss engaging students to promote pathways uh, to attract talent in behavioral health and uh, sharing best practices on mentorship because we wanna create a way that we're mentoring new employees. So that's all I have and I will stop sharing if I can. Reach out to me if you have any questions. That's it. Thanks so much, Susie. Yeah, we're starting to plug into the Balmer Scholars. Um, there's a really great investment in our region. Uh, we're working with UW School of Social Work. Really great opportunity to uh, really make it a robust um, partnership. Very similar, paralleled to the Talent Pipeline Committee. See a lot of great ways we can uh, take from our learnings from that. And with that being said, great transition to Shauna, who's going to talk a little bit more about the Talent Pipeline Committee updates.
All right. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the slides here. Good morning, everyone. Um, great to see you all. Uh, and thanks to um, Joe for uh, all of his great support in getting this uh, update ready for today. Um, as James mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is sort of the busy season for the Talent Pipeline Committee. One of the biggest things that it, we focus on is this uh, spring event. And so um, definitely wanna bring you some updates on that, but um, just as a reminder, if we could go to the next slide, um, uh, as I know, we have uh, some new folks uh, and, and some folks who've been involved in the past and maybe tuning back in. The Talent Pipeline Committee, the primary focus of the Talent Pipeline Committee is what we have called the Student Experience Package, um, which is a set of industry-led experiences that are focused particularly on engaging BIPOC and other students that are underrepresented in the healthcare industry as a part of a collective um, shared uh, talent pipeline strategy. And as a reminder, the student experience package is really sort of four primary components, the career event, which we'll talk about in a moment, which we um, kicked off the very first time together in October of 2019 in person and have had two iterations in a virtual environment since, since the pandemic. Um, and then the speakers bureau, uh, and, and we will have some updates on uh, the activity there as well. Uh, and then this video clearinghouse or a library. Um, and those two items are really directly focused on creating other um, sort of ongoing ways to, in, to connect with young people in particular, um, whether that is through speakers that are invited to classrooms by teachers or by counselors, um, or through more of a sort of self-service uh, set of videos that um, could be accessed by students, teachers, uh, community groups, um, who are in, in, in service of career exploration in the healthcare field. Uh, and then finally, the fourth component of student experience package is our mentoring uh, effort. Um, and we have some updates today as well on, uh, on where, um, where that work has, has gone. Thank you, Shauna, for providing the overview about the student experience package. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Joe. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Video Library Speakers Bureau and the mentoring program and where we've been and what we're going to do next. Uh, so with the Video Library, we've had over 54 videos now on our YouTube channel, and we have a total of 414 views since August 2021. And we've been kind of accelerating this impact by creating a video tracker that outlines, you know, who uh, has provided us with videos, what kind of videos are up on that list. And we're also been conducting outreach to educators and industries uh, to both use and upload videos onto this library. Uh, with the Speakers Bureau, we've had over 30 or around 37 engagements uh, to 1389 students across the King, Pierce, and Snohomish with about an 83% reach to BIPOC students. So we've been diverse in our geographic and racial um, outreach, um, and we've been kind of accelerating this by using this new online platform called the Smart Match app, which matches the requesters and the speakers uh, for uh, speaking engagement. And then finally, with the mentoring, we've been trying to create 10 mentorship connections between students and HILT partners in 2022. Uh, and some updates in kind of accelerating, accelerating this is we've created a new web page uh, on the HILT website that shows us um, where uh, the, or how you can sign up to be a mentor and also the types of mentoring partners that are present right now. And we're actually gonna be holding an info session uh, in July, on July 7th, where we'll have the mentoring partners and also potential mentoring, uh, mentor, in, mentor prospects to be there so that we can inform them about the uh, opportunities uh, available for them when it comes to mentoring. So when it comes to next steps for each of these three work streams, with the video library, we're asking our HILT colleagues for any uh, video uploading or creation assistance. And um, you know, that can also, that can come from existing videos that you may already have, or you know, I myself can help you with creating like a two minute day in the life video of what your uh, profession is like. And we've been creating a feedback mechanism to understand who's been watching these videos. So we're, we're gonna attach a uh, survey onto the YouTube video description so that people that uh, watch these videos can let us know, you know, uh, I, I showed this video to 30 BIPOC students in this classroom on day so-and-so. So we have a better idea of who's watching it. Uh, with the Speakers Bureau, 
We're right now trying to build up that speaker database by recruiting more industry professionals to be part of that. So if you're interested for any current or future speaking opportunities, that would be great. Uh, and then finally, I told you about the info session that's coming up on July 7th, where we're having some mentor uh, prospects from Hilt coming in uh, to uh, learn more. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor, please reach out too. So uh, specifically, you know, uh, my colleague uh, Shireen will put in some links in the chat. And if you are interested in learning more about this, uh, please fill out your contact info on that Excel spreadsheet um, to uh, let us know if you're interested in either the Video Library Speakers Bureau or mentoring work streams. And if you know of someone that might be of interest uh, with these work streams that might not be you, I've also provided an email template uh, that, you, that you can use to reach out to um, your, your colleagues. So um, looking forward to our collaboration and let me know if you have any questions. Um, and then with that, we will go to the career event that happened very recently and I will give the mic back to Shauna. Thanks, Joe, awesome. Yeah, and just a, a note, I did drop in the chat. Um, there is, uh, if you haven't already, uh, the student experience package uh, page on the Hilt website is a great resource. If you forget anything we've said today or didn't grab any of the um, uh, sort of the notes from the slides, uh, you can find links to some of the things that Joe was just mentioning, like the YouTube page. If you just wanna familiarize yourself a bit more with what's happening there, that's, that page is always a resource. Um, so thank you, thank you so much, Joe. Um, yeah, so we had our third uh, iteration of the uh, what we have now, um, I think, officially branded as Sound Careers in Healthcare event. It was at the last week of April. And similar to last year in 2021, this uh, program was a five day event with virtual daily programming, uh, kind of in the after school hours ish uh, from 3 to 4.30 p.m., and this year, the reach in terms of outreach and participation was expanded slightly to include King, Pierce, and Snohomish County. So really uh, a, a, a coverage of that broader um, Puget Sound area, but with a continued emphasis on BIPOC, low-income, and first-generation students. Um, so similar in many ways to the last year's event. The attendees, uh, again, were racially and geographically diverse. Um, you can see that uh, not quite half of the students uh, who participated um, came from King County with a pretty even distribution of the others between Pierce and Snohomish County. Um, we had roughly 45% of the students um, identified as BIPOC. Um, this is self-reported self information we did um, try to uh, ask some questions um, kind of on the way in so that we could have some information about um, where students were coming from and the demographic makeup of, of, of attendees. Um, there were, uh, not everyone chose to answer, which is of course always, uh, we, it's always optional what, what information people wanna share about themselves. And so um, we uh, will continue to be looking at that, at that data as we plan for uh, future, future iterations. The other thing I would share is that we had um, certainly, um, well, I think we had pretty robust interest in the event this year. It was definitely, um, the numbers were down from 2021. Um, and we have done some initial, um, just thinking about why that might be. I think there's probably some obvious um, uh, contributors to that. Uh, you know, One being, I think, uh, just that students themselves were in a completely remote environment in 2021. And there were a lot of things that normally happen after school weren't happening during that time. And so there was probably a lot more availability in student schedules um, and the lack of students needing to get from a physical building to maybe home where they might log in. Um, so there's some, we have some suspicions, but we'll be, I think, doing a little bit of unpacking of um, what uh, the attendance, what could, might be um, contributing factors to that, but also just what our future plans will be. Um, but you can see that we did have fairly um, consistent participation each day of the event over the five days. And so we had, I think, a pretty, pretty large number of students who participated, actually participated all five days. Um, and so there was a little bit of, I think, with a smaller group, there was sort of some familiar 
familiar, not faces, but familiar names throughout the week. And so that was kind of interesting to see students kind of get that, the succession of the big picture and then diving deeper into more and more content as the week went on. Um, so I think we had fewer, fewer participants, but more st stable and steady participation across the week. And um, in terms of the planning for the event, I think that we had um, offered uh, for, in addition to the student participation, I do think there were probably a, a slightly smaller number of uh, healthcare organizations that participated in the event, in the event this year. Um, and I think that there are probably a number of contrib contributing factors to that as well. Um, and I think there was an effort to provide a lot of different ways for industry partners to plug in, including whether people wanted to actually be in the, you know, behind the scenes, being involved in planning for the event, if they wanted to um, be uh, involved in planning just a more, much more narrowly, just a specific session or panel or presentation um, to be able to present or moderate a breakout session. Um, and then, of course, we always are um, are wel welcome any sponsorship for the event to make th make things come off. Um, I do think that the breadth of ways to get plugged in may have also led to a little bit of confusion, though. I do think, just speaking for myself, I, and how many emails <laughs> come through my inbox, it is possible that in an effort to make uh, lots of different ways to be involved, it may have left some people with a little bit confused about where to plug in and and, and what to do, and if somebody really just wanted to like raise their hand to say, I'm happy to help however, or I would be happy to speak, but I don't necessarily have bandwidth to create a whole session. I'm not sure if we um, made the opportunity to plug in available in a way that was really um, actionable for all of the, of the partners who might've wanted to be part of this. So I think that really is where we are now. We have a group that is part of the planning that will be doing more of a formal dig in and debrief, but we really wanted to bring this update back to the full hilt um, along with a question, I think, just about how we think about engagement and participation moving forward. And so um, if you, we wanted to create a little time if there are thoughts today, um, if people have ideas about, you know, maybe your own experience uh, as an industry partner trying to plug in or a community partner plugging in, or if you might have some brainstorms about, you know, now that I think about it later, it probably would have been a great idea to engage students in this way. Um, so I, if, if there are thoughts, we would very much welcome those now. Um, and and before, before we open, open the floor, I do just wanna take one minute to say a huge thank you to um, in particular James and, and Corey Garcia Hansen who were unbelievably instrumental uh, in making this event come off and both in terms of the planning and day of and to a shout out to my counterpart, Denise, we had some, <laughs> we had some late breaking huddles and some week of huddles. There was a lot of work um, to, uh, to make sure that everything kind of came together. And, um, and I just really wanted to shout out the uh, immense uh, uh, effort, creativity, uh, support, collegiality. Um, it was really a lot of fun. And I really appreciate all of the, um, the effort that, that went into the event. Um, so with that, I'll stop talking. Uh, if folks have thoughts that they want to put in the chat or if they want to come off of mute and just share, um, I think we have some, um, some good opportunities for continuing this uh, pretty pivotal part of our student experience package and, and thinking about how we um, uh, in, you know, envision this going forward. And also Denise, if you, if you feel like I missed anything that you think would be important to share with the Full Hilt membership, please, please keep me honest. Uh, I think, first of all, it was, a, it was a wonderful event. And I'm wondering if we would get better engagement if we go back to in-person. So, um, I, you know, we, um, um, I, I noticed and was pleased to see in the in the uh, stats that they were very much interested in having dialogue or some more some very specific um, knowledge around a day in a life and how to do this job. So maybe we focus on that next year in a different way so that that's the, the focal point. Um, and it, you know, we did have some technical problems and we'll work through that behind the scenes, but um, other, otherwise I'll keep out, you know, I don't have any more to add. I will, like you said, think about how we engage them 
in a different way uh, moving forward. But I think going back to in-person might make a difference. In, in our turnout. Yeah, thanks, Denise. Mm -hmm. We've also been toying with the idea of um, now that we have such a broad geographical area, which which might create some interesting wrinkles in, in having an in-person event, is there some hybrid kind of thing where you could do something that's like a virtual field trip where students are actually released from class and it happens during the day and you pair that with some, if, since we have so many healthcare organizations that are part of this collaboration, could you pair that with some more localized on-site op op opportunities, right? So maybe you could tour it with, you know, you could be like, here are your, here's your local healthcare facility that would love to welcome you for a tour as part of this, you know, day long event or two day event. So I think there's some creative thinking already, already kind of the wheels are turning um, because I think we, we pivoted pretty extremely from our massive in-person event to all virtual. And now I think we're, I mean, maybe this is just the, the state of things, right? We're going to be pivoting continuously. <laughs> that is life. Yeah, I would, I would add that I think from the three different events, I think there's just a lot more information about the overall FTE needed to deliver um, some of the different elements. And I think that that will help educate kind of, you know, based on what resources we have, um, staffing, funding, and otherwise, um, what type of event kind of follows this and kind of what is what has worked and, and what maybe needs to change. Um, so I, yeah, I think um, kind of with ongoing debriefing and analysis of the, of the last three years, I think, you know, I think overall we've delivered, a, you know, some pretty amazing events the last three years. Um, and um, I think from all those lessons learned, there's just, you know, more great work to come. Agreed. Any final questions or thoughts from anyone? I think the one of the biggest lessons learned is that we will, we were, we are already planning for next year. <laughs> it takes, it takes a while to get to pull off uh, event planning is continuous <laughs> for annual events. <laughs> Okay, I think that's all from us. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have Denise to give us an update and just share her thoughts on the cultural humility event and scenarios and, and everything that we went through last week. I think it was just a really great time um, for people to dig in and have some meaningful conversations. And yeah, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Denise. Thank you, Shalon. Can you put the slides up? I created a slide. If you could put the slide deck back up. I think James is navigating. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I didn't realize I was no longer James sharing. Take care no. of that for you. <laughs> My apology. Let me do that. Okay. Okay. So, um, as um, Echelon stated, I'm Denise Benuelos, the Director of Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity with Kaiser, and I am um, going to share with you with the Cultural Humility Workshop. Our goals for this this workshop um, was last week. It was well attended by educators. A lot of uh, good good uh, dialogue occurred from this. Our goals were to co-create questions for self-assessment and self-correction, uh, use real scenario examples from diverse healthcare delivery settings, create a shared resource library to be used by community-based educators, and use the HILT as an ongoing shared regional advisory for educators. And the, the, the takeaways from this workshop is that we learned the value of cultural humility in healthcare through Mardia, who shared basically the, um, the value of um, when it comes together, how it can, how it can, sh the complexities of patients in, in the, in the uh, intersection of their race and their gender, their sexual orientation, or even their age, in things that our, uh, our 
providers and clinicians need to be thinking about when they're addressing and, and, and assessing um, a patient's situation and, um, and how quickly bias, these scenarios it, uh, represent it, how quickly biases show up and influence their clinical decision making. So we presented two scenarios and had a full discussion around, asked questions of the audience to ask, to, to kind of tease out identifying what all of those uh, biases were and how we could have, how that clinician could have um, addressed it differently um, in order to be able to give them the best healthcare um, uh, service uh, available. And so um, those two scenarios took up majority of our discussion time. And so what I think will be some good potential next steps is that we continue building this library of scenarios. Uh, so uh, the, the members have all been asked to share what they know from their experience to help build this library. The two that were provided will be added in the library. And I do believe that there is opportunity for us to continue that discussion at the next info exchange. Um, we did get a lot of engagement and I think that this is a hot topic that needs to stay on topic until um, we feel like they're, the educators are um, feeling supported in this space um, because they're still really uh, taking in this dialogue and um, uh, figuring out how they're going to meet, you know, insert this into their uh, curriculum. So, um, but I thought it was, I thought it was a great workshop um, and I'd like to do it again. Personally, I learned during the session as well. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are having a tremendously fabulous day and it only gets better. So I'm not gonna read the chart to you. You can handle that. But there's something that we really want you to understand. We appreciate all that you do as part of the health family. And it's important that we find that balance or the word that we're all dealing with is that resilience. And that way that we stay resilient is that we understand we've got to take a step back sometimes to relax, to rejuvenate, to refocus. And so during that summertime, we're going to step away from our main meetings. Our committees will still be working in the background. Hilt's not going anywhere. We're not breaking up the party. We're just saying, here's an opportunity for us to focus on maybe family, friends, things of that nature, get some time away and then to come back recharged as we start to do our work in August and then head back to our quarterly summer meetings. So this is not goodbye. This is merely, let's take a breath. Let's rejuvenate and recharge and we'll see you back in the summer. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thanks, DJ3. Appreciate uh, that. And uh, yes, yeah, so our committees will continue to work. So check your e inboxes for um, for those invitations. But uh, we are not doing a, uh, a summer meeting, um, you know, this year. Hopefully everybody is uh, out on a beach someplace in, in August um, and uh, being able to uh, to use some of those uh, banked up PTO days we probably all have during the uh, the last couple of years. So, so um, the main part of our program today is a best practice blitz. Oh, there's been just some amazing work going on. And one of the things that we heard from folks is that we just want some time to kind of hear about some of these things that are going on um, and then be able to connect with people if, that, if that's of interest for folks. So at its core, Hilt is a network. Um, and in that network, we all have that co-learning and ability to learn from what's going on with each other. So we've got four volunteers that stepped up from some of our amazing partner organizations to be able to share what's going on. Um, this is going to be in blitz format, so you're not going to get everything. Um, but really, the purpose is, is that this is interesting to your organization or you want to be able to plug in um, to that, um, to be able to give you enough information and then who to reach out to contact afterwards. Because again, is that network part we really want 
want those informal communications to be able to happen um, even outside of our uh, of our formal meeting. So with that, we're just going to jump right in, um, and I'm just going to tee up, um, uh, or, or I guess really quickly, um, just the uh, you know as I mentioned, um, this is going to be quick um, on this. So folks are going to share what's the problem they're trying to solve, um, what's the solution that they designed, um, just some really quick for, um, you know overview of those roles, activities, and outcomes, um, and then what seems to be working, and, and what uh, what are some things that could be replicated by some of our other folks. Um, so again, kind of quick um, fashion, and um, I'll be monitoring the chat along with my other friendly co-conveners as well. So if there are questions, but definitely feel free to use that chat for that networking and shoot folks your email or contact information to be uh, to follow up with. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over um, to uh, Melvin Smith from Seattle Children's and Crystal Sales from Seattle Colleges. All right. Thank you for that, Ryan. Really appreciate that. Um... Crystal, I want to make sure is on the line here. Crystal, are you here? I am here. Can y'all see me? All right. Perfect. Perfect. I know I was having um, a little bit of issues when it came to my name as well. So when I saw the extra Shauna, I was like, I bet that's Crystal. <laughs> oh, I'm just noticing that right now. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Shauna sent us the uh, invite. So that's probably. Yep. Sorry. Probably why. <laughs> Sorry about seizing your identity. <laughs> no worries, no worries. All right, can everyone see our screen? All right, perfect. So just going to jump right in. Crystal, um, you can take it away. Sure. So good morning, everyone. My name is Crystal Salas. I am a project manager based at Seattle College's uh, workforce development um, office in the district office. And we're here to talk to you today about our partnership with Seattle Children's um, in the development of our healthcare IT Micropathway, which has actually just launched um, this past fall. So to kind of tee up our conversation, um, introducing our, our Micropathway, um, this all started off in a national partnership with a nonprofit called Education Design Lab, um, which is based in DC. And Seattle Colleges was selected to be one of six colleges of their first cohort of the Community College Growth Engine Fund. So essentially what this means is that we partnered with Seattle Children's um, to develop the healthcare IT micropathway in hopes that we can help students um, build skills that will be beneficial for the industry. So micropathways in general are two or more stackable credentials that will connect students to employment and high growth careers. Again, these are stackable, meant to be transferable, um, fast training, which means 12 months or less, um, and flexible in modality and scheduling, which you know, benefits many busy students with their own personal lives and or you know, work schedules if they are working full time as well. Um, additionally, it provides a relevant instruction and a clear path to career um, in the long run. And essentially, in development with Seattle Children's and other employers, um, we are hoping to connect low wage and entry level workers to these in demand jobs, providing living wages um, and putting them towards, you know, building up their education, either with an associate's and or bachelor's. So Seattle Children's has been an amazing partner for us and with us um, in developing the healthcare micropathway. And so um, that being said, next slide. All right, and thank you for that, um, Crystal. I can jump in here. My name is Melvin Smith. I am a supervisor for within IT Core Operations with, at Seattle Children's. Basically what that means is I oversee the hospital desktop team. And this partnership that we've had with Seattle Colleges um, has been ongoing since 2018. I think I spoke a little bit around this um, last year, but just to kind of reiterate for individuals who might, this might be new information for our, we began this kind of engagement in 2018 with an idea of creating a bachelor's degree, an applied bachelor's um, degree in health information technology. And we started building a collaboration of what that curriculum could potentially look like for Seattle colleges in 2019. As we're all aware um, of the pandemic, um, the impact of that, we paused that and were able to refocus and utilize a lot of the information that we built up from um, the, apply a bachelor's degree into this health IT um, certificate, which um, as Crystal stated earlier, has been really and truthfully beneficial because it's allowed um, 
an opportunity for that, um, as they called it, an opportunity gap for individuals who may want to go into these living um, wage careers. And so in 2021, we were able to build out the health IT micro credential program. And just to um, highlight on that a little bit, um, what that has kind of looked like is um, primary audiences for incoming healthcare workers looking for roles at Seattle Children's or other healthcare organizations, and as well as dislocated low income workers from other sectors. Um, Crystal, is there anything that you would like to add? That sounds good. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, so to delve in a little bit about the healthcare IT micropathway offered at Seattle Central College, um, this is a cohort based program up to 25 students and um, thankfully there's no prereqs required in order to start this program. It runs for about nine months long, which is equivalent to three quarters. And within the program, students get a plethora of knowledge. Um, first and foremost, there's an embedded certification for the CompTIA Plus, um, which is something that they get to um, learn and also take the tests at the end um, to get that certification. There's also um, EPIC or for the electronic health record, they have a class that also teaches them how to utilize it, best practices to troubleshoot, et cetera. Um, there's also customer service skills that are embedded throughout the program. Cause as you know, even though this is um, primarily an IT focused role, we're dealing with a lot of patients and doctors and just many different folks. Um, so customer service skills are really important in order for our students to be successful. And last but not least, um, the program is all online um, in evening classes type of modality. So if there are folks that have you know, busy lives or working part-time or full-time, they can also um, be able to balance this as well. And here's a list of all the courses that um, the students are essentially taking. As we mentioned beforehand, this is an IT um, based course or health IT. So they're getting information and fundamental skills in IT courses, as well as getting a little bit of exposure around the healthcare um, experience, for example, essential skills in healthcare and that EHR essentials um, in the first um, por portion of this particular program. And so with that, upon completion, we're hoping that individuals get in a health IT role and an opportunity to further their education through associates or bachelor's degrees programs. And essentially, the roles that we are looking for are these kind of clinical or regular service desk um, skill sets providing um, um, support for support calls, desktop technician providing on-site technical support, um, within an EHR system or within a, a networking system and clinical application analyst roles for people who might have some prior experience or even IC project management skills as well. Um, and so lastly, just wanna cover a little bit around how to get involved in next steps. And so one of the things that we're looking at is connecting us with your hiring departments for a healthcare IT career fair on June, um, prior to June 3rd. Um, there's a little bit more information on this on the next slide, but the career fair is on actually June 7th. And it's a portion of one of, one of the classes that the students are taking. And so this will be a really great opportunity to not only um, be engaged with the program for meeting potential um, applicants for roles, but just getting a feel of the student population as well and the diversity of that. And then also sharing your internal um, to with internal to those who may be interested in participating in the program as well. I've included a link and I'll share the slide deck out to the website and just be sure to check the website for any midsummer updates um, for those who may be interested in um, fall 22 enrollment. And then lastly, um, share with industry peers who may be interested in hiring graduates or sharing with potential applicants. Um, as I mentioned a little bit beforehand, we have our um, uh, career fair coming up. Volunteers will share what entry-level opportunities. It's kind of 
um, basically a three part fireside chat style um, um, career fair where organizations will have about five to 10 minutes to introduce their organization, entry level opportunities um, within their organization, um, go over some pre screen questions, which I'll be more than happy to share with um, prior to the the career fair and some questions from the students as well. And this will be taking place on June 7th um, in 2022 uh, from 7.15 to 8 p.m. And lastly, um, just as a reminder again, as far as the um, health IT um, career program as a whole, this is a screenshot of what the actual website looks, for, looks like. And we're just looking for partners to um, collaborate with for not only um, hiring students, but also um, potentially applicants as well. So more than happy to build this program with you all. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, you know, that IT infrastructure is just such a critical backbone um, to all the healthcare delivery um, that uh, that we need to be doing and uh, being able to uh, to collect that data for research, um, be able to deliver the patient experience. Um, and uh, so those IT professionals are just part of our critical infrastructure. So thanks so much. What a great collaboration between Seattle Children's and our Seattle colleges uh, to be able to provide that opportunity. And uh, I've already got that uh, June 7th event um, on my calendar as we speak. So our next folks up are from our partners at Swedish and my colleague, uh, Frankie Rowe from Seattle Jobs Initiative. So David and Frankie, take it away. Thank you, Ryan. Um, hello, everyone. I am Frankie Rowe, and I am the program manager with Seattle Jobs Initiative. And I have the pleasure of um, managing an amazing program, the IHAP program, which stands for Introduction to Healthcare and Healthcare Apprenticeships. And I have the opportunity to share with one of our great industry partners, David, who is with Swedish, David Grant, who is with Swedish. And we're just going to talk briefly about what's working, um, what are some opportunities, and um, what are some expected outcomes. And so, um, first of all, I don't know if many of you know, but I have was birthed from a program called Grow Higher, and Grow Higher was an in-person program where we were able to work with industry partners, and our participants were able to go through a six-week program. And um, from there, they were able to get hired with Seattle Children's, Kaiser, Swedish Providence, and some other um, industry partners as well. And as we know, 2020 happened. We took Grow Higher, we took some of the main pieces, um, some of the courses from the six week program, and we condensed it down to a three week program. And it became the healthcare foundations of IHAP, which is step one. Step two is the nursing assistant certified. And we do this in a partnership with um, SEIU 1199 Northwest Multi-Employer Training Fund. I think I'm forgetting a word, but you guys, I think you guys know who I'm talking about. And um, from there, participants can also look at opportunities to go into apprenticeships. And so those apprenticeships are still processing surgical um, surge tech and pharmacy tech. And so in the beginning, when participants were graduating, we, there was a bit of a struggle because of everything that was happening with um, the, the um, just the systems and things like that. And so what happened was we were able to build a relationship with Swedish and what happened with that partnership is we started to meet on a regular basis and <clears throat> excuse me from there we were we were meeting regularly we were really talking about what does this collaboration look like to get the talent through the pipeline and we went from one cohort of not being able to get our participants hired to the second cohort getting half of the um half of the cohort hired. And that was because of the relationship that we had built with Swedish. And um, it was really a great partnership because it allowed us to know a little bit more what was going on on the back end, as opposed to us 
not knowing what was going on and, and just having that dialogue on a regular basis, we started meeting weekly and um, just really talking about, okay, you know, um, who's the talent and how can we get them through the process? From there, we designed a hiring event, an online hiring event exclusive to Swedish and, um, and our partners. So they would come in, we set it up pretty simple, right through Zoom, and they would interview with the participants before the hiring event was even over, we would meet with the hiring managers and they let us know who was moving on and who needed to um, maybe go through some more, um, maybe interviewing skills, things like that. So it was really a really good partnership. And a quick case study from that was we had a husband and wife team who had gone through the program. They'd moved from Maine literally with nothing. <laughs> um, and their five children, they came here, stayed with a friend. The, um, a friend of a friend told them about IHAP. The wife went through IHAP first, and that was the, the third cohort where we started work, working out some of the kinks and getting um, the folks hired. She was hired as a patient sitter, and immediately following the next cohort, her husband enrolled. Um, they both graduated. The nursing assistant certified program aligned with, the, with their graduation and things like that. They both went through the program and both of them graduated, got hired with Swedish. She is now a traveling nursing assistant certified and she just got her first assignment in Idaho about two weeks ago. So we know that this program um, works. And so I'm going to kick it to David. I know I said a lot. David, did you have anything that you wanted to share just on what's working? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so uh, as Frankie said, uh, I think that we're all taking a, a, a new look at this program. I myself have been involved with, uh, with this relationship for about seven months. Uh, and naturally, the pandemic has created uh, the need for us to really reimagine um, what this program looks like uh, and keeping in mind the ultimate goal, at least my ultimate goal of, you know, how do we best prepare these graduates for the roles that they're interested in? Uh, some of the ways we've gone about that, as Frankie, you know, illustrated, you know, really open and uh, no pun intended, very frank uh, conversation about what is working and where we have some opportunities. Um, and, you know, I'm the, I'm the person that's real upfront to say there's always room to grow. Um, not being an in-person um, venue for these individuals to interview, I think has definitely created a new challenge. Um, uh, everything down to the application process, I think um, having these elements completely remote in some ways has left the candidates um, to fend for themselves um, without the assistance of the, the program leaders at SGI to assist them um, getting the applications um, and best preparing them for the interview process. Other ways, um, uh, Frankie mentioned that uh, we have uh, a presentation for them at the start of the program. One advantage um, I think that we have is that we went through some of the potential job descriptions that they had expressed interest in and walked through some of the finer points of those jobs, not just the requirements, but really in layman's terms, what, what do we mean um, when we read some of the bullets, um, you know, the requirements uh, and experience needed in these jobs? We also open it up to the to the cohort for a little Q and A to let them ask some specific questions that they might have had about the roles. Equally as important as I went to our core leaders and went to the service line leaders of those particular uh, positions and made sure I prepared those individuals for not only the IHAP cohort and discuss what the program involved, uh, but made sure that they were aware and eager for the graduation uh, that's coming up here in the first week of June. Uh, we put together a virtual hiring event as well as we have some in-person opportunities depending on the position that the individuals are looking to looking to uh, fall into. So again, just making sure we understand that these individuals are looking for um, job opportunities and best preparing them is really um, what we keep in the back of our minds to make sure that uh, we're leading them in the right direction. Awesome. Thank you, David. And I believe that the partnership is just getting 
um, is just becoming more and more strengthened as we have those in-depth conversations and um, we really talk about how can, you know, we strengthen this partnership for the benefit of our participants in the community because they talk and they let one another know what happened dur during the training and things like that. And that's generally how we get some of our participants to come back through the program is because they see the success that someone in their community or a friend or family member had through the program. And it's just been an incredible partnership and we really appreciate Swedish and been able to um, just continue to work on this relationship so that um, I think one of the questions was, um, how can, can this be um, duplicated or replicated by other agencies? And I believe the answer is yes. I believe that with um, great dialogue and communication and you know being honest about what you can and what you can't do that um, you can build an amazing partnership with a program and an industry partner. And so one of our partners, one of our great partners has been Swedish. So I just wanna give a shout out to Swedish Providence. We appreciate you all here at Seattle Jobs Initiative on behalf of our partners um, or our participants. We just wanna say thank you and thank you to Hilt as well. I also wanted to add, frankly, that I think there's an opportunity for two-way learning in this in this venture. Uh, there has been um, two-way learning in this venture uh, from our side of things. When we've been when we've had the opportunity to hire some of these individuals, um, working with SJI, they're able to give us you know concrete feedback on how things like the onboarding process are going, um, and those are areas that with knowledge of where some of the pain points are, we're able to communicate that back internally and look for opportunities to, to clear those pathways out. On that note, Swedish has some, some enhancements to, to, um, to really stand by the new hires. We have a, a new program called Onboard Me that essentially assigns new hires a specialist to, to be with them as they go through the many intervals of the onboarding and what we call pre-boarding process, everything from, you know, getting your direct deposit set up, submitting different forms, uh, as well as the compliance uh, and trainings necessary when you have when you have a new hire. Effectively, we have a specialist who's going to um, monitor uh, the new hire, and if certain SLAs have passed, for example, if a couple of days have passed uh, and the candidate is still in the same uh, place in the process, uh, that specialist will reach out to the candidate to make sure that uh, if they have any difficulties, we can address those. And ultimately, you know, keep the ball rolling as opposed to them being on an island by themselves and, and stuck in the process where they really could probably use some assistance. So that's been a great opportunity for us to get that that transparency on what are some of the areas that uh, might might be troublesome for the applicant. On the other side, um, we're able to go back to our hiring managers and speak with them about the interview process, and they're able to give us some tangible feedback on some areas that they might um, that they might think could be enhanced in the, in the, in the, in the program that SCI is administering to these candidates. Uh, again, the goal is to make sure these candidates are best prepared uh, for the interview and for the roles that they're applying to. So being able to share that information and that feedback, I, I think is a great addition. Awesome. And Ryan's put some of just some, a few of the positions in the chat, I'm gonna call them out and then we can move on from there. Um, patient sitter, nutrition, assistant, environmental services, material, distribution technician. Um, we're also now getting more of an admin role for those who come with more skills. And so that has been a great addition to be able to add. And um, there's a barista as well. So it gives people an opportunity to see where they can get their foot in the door. And if um, moving on to get their CNA is the next step for them. That's amazing. Um, but if, you know, staying and working at Swedish, which is a great organization and moving on from there, then we help them with that as well. So um, I don't have anything else. Do you have anything else, David? I don't. All right. So we're past the baton back to either Ryan or James. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Frankie and David. I appreciate that. And uh, just wanted to give another shout out to our partners at the Training Fund. Um, is there uh, per, is there key parts in this in delivering that online um, CNA instruction for that step two um, for individuals that are able to uh, to go on? Um, and uh, they've just been um, amazing partners there. And then we are hoping to link this up. So tying all this work together, back to some of our updates earlier, the behavioral health apprenticeships that are gonna be coming online. Um, IHAP is gonna be serving as a 
funnel for folks to learn about those and then get some of those um, key competencies that they're going to need to succeed as a behavioral health apprentice. So uh, excited um, to be able to tying some of these things together. So um, with that, we're going to move um, actually to our neighbors. Um, so neighbor care is uh, right next to SGI's office in uh, Pacific Tower, at least their, uh, their healthcare IT office is. Um, so glad to pass the baton over to neighbor care and Lena and Yoli. Thank you, Ryan. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. And what we're going to share today is not directly workforce development related. However, the work that's happening around our project management team is helping us figure out how best to use our internal resources, how to prioritize projects, and how to assign those resources to support our strategic plan. So Lena Rubenstein, our project management team lead, is here to share with us all about that. Great, thanks Yoli, nice to meet you all. And um, hello to my alumni, Seattle Children's Friends, really good to see you again. Um, so um, as Yoli said, my name is Lena. I am actually a consultant for an organization called Slalom, but I have had the distinct privilege of working with Neighbor Care over the last nine months to help build their project management team. Um, and so before I get started, I just want to do some key thanks to our organizational sponsors of this work. So our IT director, Sarah Ramsey, she kicked this all off um, on her own, starting a PMO in IT at Neighbor Care. And then our interim CEO or COO, Cora Weed, who's been our guide supporting us through this entire development, helping us make adjustments to the model, align it with Neighbor Care's organization's culture and practices. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are we talking about today? So my goal today is to tell you a little bit about the story about our, our experience building a project management team at Neighbor Care. Um, you might be familiar with a, a PMO as the term or enterprise PMO, um, but we uh, at Neighbor Care are calling it a project management team that felt more appropriate. So we'll go over sort of why we started on this engagement, what our design process was, where we are now, and what's really working well and what where we know we can continue to improve. Thank you. So what did we start with? So um, when uh, COVID hit, uh, Neighbor Care submitted a large number of grants for projects through ARPA, um, including funds to manage their um, implementations. And when they realized that they needed to go through the implementation of all these massive projects at once, because they're happening on a timeline for that grant, they realized that they had not sort of tried to navigate competing priorities before and really needed an organizational structure to be able to coordinate and build a framework around executing multiple projects at once. So it started, like I said, at the beginning as an IT PMO, and that was actually very successful, but it was limited in scope. So we needed to bring it out to the whole organization. Next slide, please. So what we did was we wanted to um, ensure that we were creating a sustainable change. What we heard when we were starting to build this project management team is that uh, uh, building uh, new processes and tools in the organization had been a challenge before. So we were really intentional about wrapping really strong change management about the whole thing. And so we were really intentional about creating a structure that would deliver sustainable change. So the key things that we were trying to address are action and accountability. Does everybody in the organization know what we're working on? Is there a way for the organization to hold leaders to account for solving the problems that are routinely expressed? Making sure that we are doing thorough implementations, choosing the right work to carry forward and doing it in a way that uh, ensures the work is completed thoroughly. Um, building capacity and burnout. I'm sure all of you are well aware that COVID has been tremendously difficult on the healthcare organizations that are serving our communities. And so we wanted to give leaders time back to lead and not carry that project management burden, which they had been doing before. So really finding the right people to do the right work. We wanted to also build a structure that would ensure we had inclusive staff and patient engagement. So bringing more structure to how we bring people into projects and not reinforcing using the same leaders over and over again. And then of course, everything to ties back to how we support patient care. So it everything roots to delivering the best possible care for all of our patients that we serve. Next slide, please. Um, so this is this is part of our a slide deck from a strategic plan that we helped them build um, uh, at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. And you can see there in the middle that establishing a project management team, the structure, um, aggregating all the org-wide projects that were happening and developing change management as a 
as a competency within the organization was one of the key initiatives to be able to improve organizational and operational efficiency. Next slide, thank you. So this was our roadmap that we started with. So we broke it out into three phases and it's really about build, growing, and then maturing. So our build phase started in early December. And during those three months, we basically built out the structure that would prepare the organization for a spring launch. And that was really about getting the, getting the roles defined, building the governance model, establishing the tools and templates, collecting all of those projects that were happening all over the organization onto one list. That's a bigger job than you think it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, we launched that in, in the, at the end of March. And then we've really been in sort of the grow phase since then, where we're looking at how we are stabilizing the, the tools that we've built out, making sure that what we built in theory actually works in practice, making adjustments as we need to as we go along. So I'll point out a couple of key things. So project management team was new to neighbor care. Um, so what we wanted to establish was the PM team would be a separate department that would be responsible entirely for managing, prioritizing, and tracking all of neighbor care's projects across every department. So we created a portfolio of projects and prioritized them based on neighbor care strategic goals and objectives. And then we staffed it up with a team of project managers. And thinking back to sort of some of the other topics that others have touched on as far as developing the workforce, we were really intentional about building a team that would have multiple levels of project managers, ways for people to come into project management if they worked in other areas of the organization. And we've got a couple of initiatives going on right now, working, for example, with the school-based teams who will be off for the summer and bringing them in as sort of um, project assistants or project coordinators so that they can get an experience of project management, use their time wisely, and also build those skills throughout the organization. So we've been really intentional about making sure that there's opportunities for growth there as well. So I talked a little bit about the change management and um, it's it's was critical here, right? We're taking, this is not just standing up a new department saying go. Um, the, we had to adjust what people were, the practices that they were doing, the tools they were using. It was a massive cultural change to sort of take something that had been um, really designed around people sort of like desires and needs and um, wanting to push things forward sort of on their own scales and really trying to corral those in a way that was meaningful so that we had held people accountable to delivering outcomes, but also that we prevented collisions. We were using our resources wi uh, wisely and making sure that we were, everything that we took on led up to those strategic objectives because there's just way too much to do and way too much important work that we can't do all at the same time. Um, so this is just an example of some sort of one of the tools that we use to help assess who would be impacted by the PMT and how we would um, address the level of change that happened with them. And then this is a, a different uh, piece of the tool that we're using. This is the project team role. So this is one of the items that we created to sort of help the organization and different members understand what a project management team could look like and um, what those different roles would play. We're really intentional about making these very flexible. Neighbor Care is a small organization. There's a lot of people um, who have to wear multiple hats at once in a project. And so, um, somebody might be a project manager in title, or they might be a project acting as a project manager on that project, or they might even be the owner of that project as well. So, but we wanted to be clear about what sort of responsibilities that person had if they were taking on that role, because that's what helps the project team function really well in a really repeatable way. We also built a governance structure. Um, so what we developed was a, a model that would have sort of the, the project management teams and the work groups who are working on the individual projects there um, at, that you see at the bottom. The project management team is uh, the team that I'm helping lead. So that's the rest of the formally titled project managers. We're also responsible for maintaining that portfolio, reporting out on the metrics for how successful um, the um, the projects are being what you know escalating things to leadership as needed and then the steering committee so that steering committee is made up of most of the directors at neighbor care and they're currently determining all the prioritization of those projects so we built a prioritization model helps them figure out how we're going to align all of these things that all feel really important right um, and actually assigning some numbers to them so that we can really rank prioritize them um, and then that, if that steering committee, you know, needs some, some hits a roadblock, then that we have our senior leadership team as a final escalation point. 
Um, and so then you'll, this is, sorry, this is a build slide. You'll just want to click through a couple of times to get those bullets to pop up. Perfect. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about where we've started to see success. So we have seen really good uptake of the toolkits and the usability of the framework. We've brought on um, five new project managers since we've started, and many more are using the toolkits we developed. We were really intentional about building those toolkits as resource light. For any of you who have done project management before, you know that there are sort of 27 different software programs that you can use that are really complicated. We built ours really light so that they could be consistently used. We have staff using the intake process and the resourcing process to model sort of like the end to end project management. We've seen lots of new projects come through. We've seen them get resourced um, and are doing a really good job sort of developing clear understanding of roles and framework there. And um, most importantly, we also introduced a sustainability framework. That was something that was really new in closing projects. We wanted to make sure that we were modeling what the, a good handoff and closure of a project looks like. That's really hard to do. Um, I'm sure all of you have experienced this at some point, but you know those projects that sort of slow to a trickle or you know sort of the never ending pilot, all of those things were really important. Um, next is definitely making sure that we have this uh, cross-functional um, and visibility um, across the organization. So we've got, um, we built sort of a standard uh, weekly status call where everyone who's acting as a project manager comes in and reports on their status. Even using Excel and um, their data visualization tool, we built uh, a tool that everyone can update collectively from their project workbooks. And then we can display the status so that everyone in the organization can navigate to that same tool and see what the status is of any given project at any time. And so we're building that consistency of communication across the organization and building accountability there. Um, we're also adopting new change management methodology. We've taught some really light sort of change management tools um, to everyone. And they can be used right for organizational tools change as well as project level change. So we're seeing those be adopted where we're getting more consistent about how often and where we communicate, um, using the tools to assess who the right audience is to communicate to, one of the ones that I showed at the beginning, um, and making sure that you're training people appropriately and at the right time, giving them the right knowledge that they need to be able to um, impart that change. And then lastly is around re reducing collisions. Sorry, we just went back one more second. Sorry, I'll be faster. Um, so really, the this has been the biggest challenge and I think an, a real area for us to improve. But learning to plan how for, for resource allocation and developing the muscle and infrastructure to say, like, no, we cannot take this on right now has been really challenging. And it is an ongoing battle because there's so much important good work to do. Um, but there's only so much time in the day and being really successful is um, in this project management is is really hinges on our ability to say not right now. Um, we've definitely learned um, the balance, uh, learned some things as far as in implementing this. Um, the balance of training versus doing at the beginning of this was really hard to overcome. Um, as we were building this, people were really eager to get started. They were excited about using the tools and making sure that we had everyone on the same page, speaking the same language, doing the training was so hard. And I still don't feel like we hit the right balance, but we're, you know, learning and evolving as we go. There's also um, a like significant sense of change fatigue in the organization as a whole. I mean, the highs and lows of COVID up and down, you know, it just has been exhausting. And um, neighbor care is also going through a leadership change at the same time. So that change fatigue, as well as the urgency meant that we had a lot of feedback sort of like pushing and pulling us um, that we wanted to adjust to. And then the last thing I will say is that going from no framework, sort of like letting everyone sort of wild west doing what they want to having like really more strict framework was a big swing. And I don't think that I, at least as an individual, um, sort of trying to help teach this to the organization understood what the, how big the change was um, until after we imparted it. So some lessons learned there. So now we're in the grow phase. We definitely still have a lot of work to do here. Um, the cultural change required to resource effectively and prioritize our highest value work, like I said, is a constant evolution. It's so heartbreaking to say no to work that is really important and that people are really passionate about. Um, we're also actively working to disrupt our power structure. Um, you know, I talked earlier about how we set up the steer co-governance model. We, we know that governance is important in project management and in organizations, but inherently that creates gatekeeping authorities. And we are not, we have not, we're not finished like furthering our organizational 
uh, mission to embody EDI in everything we do. So we're actively pursuing right now some adjustments that we could make to make the steering committee more inclusive as well as the project management makeup. Um, we also need to improve our model and framework for including the patient voice in everything we do. It's a big area of opportunity with project work and especially work that we're doing that directly impacts patients. So we have a lot of areas to grow there. And we're working on teaching our leaders on how to run, how to own their responsibility within a project um, while stepping back from handling the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, sort of uh, ticking and tying that the project manager is doing. So building the habits for how a project manager and leader work together as a successful dyad is really critical and an area of us growth for us. That was really fast. So um, uh, there's a, I know there's a bunch of uh, sort of like, uh, appendix slides in here that you also get to see. So if you have any questions about those, um, feel free to reach out to me, but this is sort of, that's some more background. I think I saw some questions in the chat so we can skip through these. Um, yeah, awesome, Lane, cool. would you mind uh, throwing your contact information in the chat for uh, for folks to be able to uh, to reach out to you would be fantastic afterwards. Absolutely, happy to Awesome. Thank you so and, much. Uh, this was super awesome and uh, thanks so much. And uh, please come back and join us. So um, even though I'm not presenting, um, we, we are wide open for folks and uh, love to see you at, uh, at future um, HILT meetings as well as we tackle um, a bunch of different challenges. But thank you so much for showing, uh, for sharing your wisdom with us today. So we have one more um, presentation in our best practice blitz. So if your minds are not already spinning, um, get ready for them to be spun up um, as we get uh, as we pass the baton over to DJ3 to talk about Health Point University. DJ3, take it away. Thank you so very much. And uh, thank you for that incredible love the chart game. Your chart game was on point. It was on point. You were killing it. Hey, uh, so thank you all so very much. Real quick, I'm going to need your participation, your help with this part of the presentation. Down towards the bottom of your screen, there should be a reaction area. Find that reaction area. I'm going to hit you with some questions. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs down. Let me know if this resonates with you. How many people in your organization are dealing with competing requirements? Competing requirements. If you're dealing with that, give me that thumbs up. Competing requirements. How many of you are dealing with staffing shortages? Anybody dealing with staffing shortages? How about cost? Anybody dealing with cost issues, trying to keep your cost contained, trying to keep your margins? Okay, great. I'm wondering, just curious. You may not be experiencing this. What about retention? Anybody having retention issues? Okay, okay, all right. Hmm. Anybody trying to upskill your talent to help prepare them for the job they're doing now and the jobs they're gonna do in the future? Anybody working on that? Engagement, anybody trying to increase employee engagement? <coughs> Excuse me. If you are, then you are exactly in the place for thinking about learning and developing of your team. Just some quick facts here. When people ask, well, what problem are we trying to solve? All of the things I just issued are problems we are trying to resolve. How do we manage competing requirements? How do we deal with staff shortages? How do we deal with costs and maintaining those costs? How do we in increase our retention, develop our team and increase engagement? Just some data here that, is out there, 94% of employees say they will stay with an organization if it invests in their development. Employees who don't feel like they're being engaged, being challenged, uh, being leveraged, 10 times more likely to leave your organization. Organizations that have that strong learning culture, 92% more productive, more innovative, and here's this big one, it's really scary, but some of you said you're dealing with retention issues. Think about it, 1.2 or 1.5 to two times is the cost it takes for you to hire a new employee. And imagine if you are doing that repeatedly. I know in some spaces, MAs are a big challenge for all of us. We're hiring and rehiring. Imagine what that's doing to your budget. So how can we attack this? Let's look at that next slide. 
it really talks about driving a learning culture within your organization. And when we think about a learning culture within the organization, it's not just saying we have learning. It's really about connecting an ecosystem that combines a culture that's focused on learning, a growth mindset, provides formal learning and multiple modalities and partnerships in various ways to help provide the right learning and the right time and the right format at the right cost. So to do that, you've really got to create an ecosystem. And for your ecosystem to work, you've got to have some very clear, very clear objectives of what you're trying to deliver with your ecosystem. In our case, we're focused on leadership, communication, collaboration, and role-specific learning. Can we do other learning? Yes. But if we're going to address those issues, we really need to focus on those areas. You've also got to have the right tools to support your system. You know, uh, as we saw in that last presentation, without a good framework, without the right tools and techniques, we can struggle and just spin our wheels. And how many of you have ever been invited to something? You thought it was going to be really great. You got there and it was like, yeah, no, I wish I'd have, I, I, yeah, okay, I see some smiles. I see some head nods, right? You don't want your learning experience to be that. Because if employees invest the time to come to our learning experiences and they don't take anything away from it, they will like, yeah, I'm not coming back to that anymore. And then you also have to be committed to supporting the business outcomes. What are your strategic imperatives? How do we optimize our costs? And in our case, how do we help uh, get that return on investment, which is really providing that great care that we think every patient deserves. Let's look at that next slide, please. So the way we do it at HealthPoint is through HealthPoint University. HealthPoint University is a construct that is yet, is there actual physical university? No, but we got some great t-shirts, great t-shirts. Uh, you know, this one speaks to uh, our challenge in 22. We challenged every employee in HealthPoint. We said, go learn something new in 22. And then we're randomly giving t-shirts to individuals who are going out and learning because we really want people to understand the value of that growth mindset, that value of we are always learning. So how do we do it? We do it through multiple programs. Frontline Leaders Program, which is our core leadership program aimed at supervisors and above our emerging leaders program, where we're identifying those individuals who are high potential, but also those individuals who think, I might wanna explore leadership. Through that program, we give them an opportunity to acquire skills to help them show up better today, but also begin to prepare them for taking on that role into the future. Jumpstart, it's our nine, what I like to call our 911 program. You're a leader, maybe you're new to the role, maybe you've never had any experience, any formal learning, and you might need some additional support, some additional coaching. Our 911 program is Jumpstart. We come in, we take you through communication, we thank you through coaching, we thank you through uh, delegating and, and empowering your staff, and then we take you through resolving workplace, conf uh, workplace conflicts. And then we support you with coaching sessions. So you get three coaching sessions after you completed that learning to help you continue to practice and build your skills. We've got the Everyday Leader Series. It's a drop-in leader series done virtually, open to everybody in the organization. It creates awareness and it provides tools that can be taken back to someone's desk and they can continue to practice those skills. We even have an elective track. So most of our programs are cohort based where we bring together a group of cohorts that go through the program together. However, we understand the realities of your work, your commitments, they may not allow you to do a cohort, cohort experience. We've got the elective track. We let you take it when you can take it so you may not complete the program in six months. You may complete it in 18 months, 24 months, but you still get that valuable learning experience that your peers have. And we also get the advantages of creating common language, common lexicon across the organization. 
We deliver it in multiple modalities. We do in-person, we do virtual, we do e-learning, we do blended learning, and we're even today doing all of this without an LMS, but I'm happy and excited to say we'll be bringing an LMS on board in the third quarter, and we're really excited about the capabilities that that will bring to the organization. We've done some branding to get people excited about Health Point University and excited about learning. And around the margins, you see some of that. We've got our, our crest, has any great learning institution should have. And we, we've got certificates that are customized, that look nice on the wall, or people can hold this up and say, this is mine. This is a testament to what we've done, and we want to celebrate that. And then, of course, uh, we're learning something new in 22. It's a challenge we put forward to the organization. So you might be saying, okay, DJ3, this is great. This is fabulous. It's spectacular. It sounds good. Are you achieve, re, achieving any results? Well, let's take a look. Next slide, please. This is from our activities in 2021. Uh, we believe everyone deserves great developmental opportunities. So in 2021, we had over 70 opportunities for learning engagements, over 225 contact hours. And for people who may not be learners, don't worry about that. Just basically means how much time we're connecting with people. Yada, yes, don't worry about it, it's okay. Uh, over 450 learners came through our programs. So of an, that is 45% of that total health point population came through one of our learning programs. So we are excited about that. We had a cohort and frontline leaders program, two cohorts in Jumpstart, two cohorts in the emerging leaders program. We ran an onboarding, a we advanced, you reimagined onboarding session that we did 12 times. We do an insights, we just did tons of stuff. And then, oh, by the way, we went and talked to Renton and Renton got excited and said, hey, we like what you're doing, so we're gonna celebrate. And we got approximate approximation from the Renton mayor. So all of these things are about learning. And again, this is, this is exciting, it feels good. And you're saying, okay, DJ3, you're doing again a lot of stuff. What does it translate to from a learner perspective, from a business perspective? Here's what it translates to. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, Evelyn. You can read Evelyn's story there. Evelyn came through one of our learning programs. Uh, as you can see, Evelyn came into the organization as a front desk person, uh, became a QIC, a customer service representative. Uh, and I'm sure within your organizations, these are kind of the same paths that you're finding your folks going through. Uh, but Evelyn, in her own words, talked to the value of learning. And when was provided the opportunities to do learning, acquired skills that made her a more impactful and more effective leader. And that's the real testament to are we having, making a difference at Health Point? And I would say the answer to that question is absolutely yes. So learning is important. And in today's market, if we aren't upskilling, if we aren't helping our team acquire the skills, the knowledge and abilities that they need for the role they're in today and equipping them for the roles that they'll be in in the future, we're failing our teams. Can you do this in your organization? Absolutely. Because I did this in 2021 as a team of one. That's right, just DJ3 reaching out into Health Point, grabbing a hold of some incredible people who are also excited about learning, brought them in to support and assist, and we were able to stand and deliver. So can you do it? Yes. Uh, outcomes, you're gonna have to fight the good fight. You're gonna have competing requirements, staffing shortages, cost issues, retention. To, you're gonna have leaders who are gonna say, hey, this is more important. And that's where you'll need to be steadfast and unmovable and helping them to understand 
that an investment in their employees' development is an investment in learning that will return efficiencies in time, first time quality. It'll begin to replicate within your team and you'll find that that investment will make you a better team. Next, what practice? You gotta be consistent. You gotta do it. And so we've got just a few moments for questions, if there are any. All right, fantastic. Thanks, DJ3, and thanks to um, all of our presenters um, today during our Blitz. And uh, hopefully you know how to get in touch with them. So DJ3, if you want to throw your email in the chat as well, um, like our other presenters, that way folks can uh, network after and, and dig into um, to all of these uh, these great um, opportunities. Um, so really quick, um, just uh, before we move into um, you know our closeout here as we're getting um, towards the end of our time, want to open floor, are there any other things um, that you all are doing um, to be able to skill up your workforce? We've heard some great um, ideas um, today, um, but just want to open the floor if anybody's got anything either to add it into the chat um, or if you want to come off mute um, and just share what's awesome in your organization. We'll just give a few minutes to do that. I know these are hard asks to follow with uh, some of the great things that, uh, that are going on in our partner organizations. James, may I, or Ryan, excuse me. Yes, sir, go ahead. I would just quickly share with everyone, the realities are changing in the sense of where we are today. The days of completely one or the other are gone. And if we want to be successful moving forward, we're going to have to diversify, which means not only do you need to upskill your employees, but you need to upskill yourselves. Very often as leaders, we are so busy doing the work, leading the work, that we don't take time to say, how do I sharpen my tool set? So I want to challenge you, like I challenged HealthPoint, learn something new in 22. Sharpen your skill set, expand your skill set, look at ways that you can improve what you're doing. Consider reverse mentoring, finding a young person who can help mentor you. Uh, if we do those things, that's how we will achieve results. So just want to bring that to people's attention as you're looking at improving the workforce. Don't forget about yourself. Good deal. All right. Well, I think uh, with that, um, some good stuff happening in the chat. Um, I see Denise um, is sharing that a KP Workforce Development is offering a career path series for all of our all their patient facing roles, uh, which is awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just let those uh, those roles be, um, you know, please continue to share those things out in the chat. And if you can't think of something right now or something you wish you would have shared, uh, we will definitely have ways to continue to plug in um, with Hilt. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Denise from Kaiser for uh, just a quick recap and then six ways to plug in with Hilt as we go into what is hopefully a delightful summer. Denise. Great. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, DJ3. Very inspiring. <laughs> I, I took lots of notes. <laughs> okay, so there's six ways to plug in. So we have our mentoring program. If you are, we're seeking mentors. So if you're interested in being a mentor, please um, let us know. Um, we have another way to plug in would be their speakers bureau, which was mentioned earlier, uh, and our video library. And, and I believe that these um, links were put into the chat earlier. And you can uh, contact Joe at uh, uh, wobsalliance.org to, uh, to coordinate for any of these opportunities. Um, our Centennial Network Healthcare Questionnaire is now open, and it is one of the quickest ways that our regular healthcare employers can communicate twice a year with policymakers. Um, and we do need you to uh, put in your uh, your your 
whatever problems that you're you're experiencing or or ask this is an opportunity for your voice to be heard so definitely uh plug into the centennial network and and take that questionnaire today uh the survey has been extended till monday june 6. and then we have the engage the next generation of it talent which children's hospital um, is looking for volunteers to join uh and that was also showcased earlier and so this is um you know if you or a representative of your organization would like to uh showcase um you know, different things that are going on in IT that for that would that would be a benefit to the career fair that is going to be held on June seventh. Please reach out to Melvin Smith at Seattle Children's or at with Scott Bingham with um, Seattle Children's. Then also in Reach Medical Assistant Apprentice Program enrollment is opening for the July. 2022 cohort. Um, they're having an information session. Actually, they already had the information session on May 19th. Um, that uh, Ryan, do you know if that was recorded? Uh, I don't know, but if you uh, definitely, um, if you reach out um, to them, they will be happy to be able to share the information. So Ariel's okay. contact information is there. Okay, great. At along at, at um, wacommunityhealth.org. Thank you. And then also, um, you can now register for AHEC upcoming Northwest, Northwest Healthcare Career Path, which is uh, scheduled for June 2nd and 3rd from 8.30 to noon. 8.30 to 12.30. And this is gonna provide uh, opportunity for administrators and staff to work across the healthcare career path to convene to address the shared objectives of establishing equitable pathways. And then there's the uh, Seattle Skills Center Medical Assisting, which is in need of Lincoln High School substitute teachers until the end of the school year, June 17th. So um, we can help provide an emergency uh, CTE conditional teaching certificate and an emergency substitute certificate if you're interested in helping them with, their, uh, with this, uh, this gap. And we'll be advertising full-time, they'll be advertising full-time positions um, from 2022 to 2023 school year. Um, so please contact Susan Grant at seattleschools.org for more information and to let her know if you're interested in being a substitute teacher. Awesome. Thanks so much, Denise. So just our, uh, I think, yeah, so closing us out, um, our final word and then some upcoming topics. Um, back to DJ3. I was so, I was just like so overwhelmed. I, I had to take a moment to regroup. <laughs> But it was a phenomenal thank you all for sharing and and this is the beauty of hilt this is the beauty of hilt it's multiple ideas coming from multiple sources creating a true cosmic wonderful incredible fabulous tapestry that we can all use to help improve our realities you can take this part take this part take this part as we go forward, you'll see on the schedule, we've got a support meeting coming up. We've got the talent pipeline committee coming. We're gonna take a vacation. Take a va and truly, my challenge to you is take a vacation. Okay, cut, cut the computer off, turn it, cut the cell phone off. It's okay. Put the out of office note up and truly be out of office. We come back September 1st for our quarterly meeting and then September 22nd for our partner check-in. We want to encourage you to continue to support Hill, continue to come, bring a friend. This is an incredible opportunity for us to create pathways and opportunities for that future workforce, which impacts our community and allows us to make sure that everyone gets the great care that they deserve. Great. Thanks, uh, DJ3. And uh, thanks, everybody, and particularly all of our presenters um, today. And uh, just two real quick plugs. Please fill out the Sentinel Network. That data is so important for so many of our district initiatives going on. And Corey put a link into the Northwest Healthcare Summit. Uh, probably will see some familiar faces. So um, if you're missing your help friends um, or and also to meet some uh, more friends as well, please sign up for that event. It's going to be fantastic. So um, thanks, everybody. Um, have a great summer and uh, look forward to seeing everybody soon.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Have a great day. Have a great summer. You rock. You're amazing. You're fabulous. <laughs> You're spectacular. <laughs>